I don't know. I usually notice it. I don't know. <laughs> I notice it too, but I don't like. It's not something I'd like really pay attention to. Yeah. I like to score when I watch films. I don't know if that's the same thing. It has qualities that I don't find in some other aspects of music because it's meant to tell a story or enhance a story, and I like dramatic music that works for me. I pay attention to the background music, like when it's like really eerie, because you can it tells you like what's going to happen next a lot of times. I have a problem with films that kind of sledgehammer the soundtrack at you to create emotions that are in a way kind of contrived. Film music is not something that's sort of made to be noticed and. And even myself, I mean, I'm a big film music fan, but you get sucked into a movie and you stop listening, which is what's supposed to happen. Usually the music that, like, makes you emotional more so than, like, you know, or enhances whatever emotion they're trying to, like, elicit. The better film music, fortunately, seems to work uh, beyond the film or TV program it was composed for, and that tends to be the mater material I'm more drawn toward. I think film music was great for me because I was able to catch on to a lot of di different genres, like actual musical genres, because of film music. Because no one soundtrack is the same. No one soundtrack has to be written in one vein. It can be written in a number of veins. It's effective, but in a sort of uh, uh, pedestrian way, which is what I object to. It's a little too deliberately manipulative. It can get your blood pumping, set a romantic mood, scare you, whatever. It's just the audio-visual associations there. I'm not sure they consciously notice it, but if it was missing, I think that they would notice that there's mm -hmm. a lot lacking. I think there's a kind of a, a drama inherent in film music because that's what it is. And it's accessible. And I think that's one of the tenets of film music is that audiences aren't threatened by the sound of the, of the music, unless you want them to be, unless you're ripping somebody's heart out of their body, then you want the music to terrify them, but for the most part it doesn't do that. It just really does create the subtext to enhance the visuals. In the case of film music, it was composed to go with a certain film, um, and how it works as film music may not be the same way it works as recorded music. There's a definite difference there. But I think one needs to keep in mind the fact it was written to accompany a film. It is supportive music, and that gives it maybe more validity or maybe less, depending on your attitude. Say Elton John just recently reworked one of his famous pieces, obviously, for the recent funeral. Um, people think of that as artistry, you know, artistry. I mean, that's really a significant performance, and they really want to hear the piece of music. I don't think very many people think of it as it was intended to accompany you know, the funeral, so it's subservient to the reason people are getting together, of course, as a funeral, not to hear Elton John. Somehow film music's been denigrated to this level where, yeah, but it's really written for movies. When you take it away from movies, you're somehow subtracting something out of the whole element, and it can't possibly be anything more than just a part of it. We all discover film music through the films, I think. I don't think many people actually discover film music from listening to the records. I think you eventually sort of move away from it and the films become less important as you uh, get to know a particular composer and, and follow their work, the films have become irrelevant. As if it was really, I started taping stuff off the telly, you know, the old horror yeah. film music yeah, and stuff like that. Still buying them tapes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bought a few disastrous bootleg tapes. That were very good. It's quite physical music. I mean, although, I mean, the physicality is an emotional response, but it is a physical response. You know, I remember somebody once saying that they were listening to a Jerry Goldsmith um, action cue and they said, you know, they could go and rob a bank, you know, they were so psyched up by it. The first collecting wave, real big collecting wave for film score music occurred in the very late 60s, early 70s, when people started looking back at some of the gorgeous music that had occurred. At that point, they started realizing what they had lost, and most of them had been thrown away, or still remained in a few collections, and they were very difficult to come by. That's what put the first wave of soundtrack collecting in, and why they became early on quite rare and very expensive. They were really more marketing tools than anything else. That was sort of de rigueur that you would release an album when a film came out just so you could pass it out to the press when they came to the preview or the premiere. Throughout the 40s, most of the material was produced on 78 RPM records and multi-vitamin sets. They were usually uh, and primarily were studio tracks. The first actual original soundtrack released on records once you got past Disney once I believe from 1948 and that was Madame Bouverie.
I enjoy going through CDs, but I just don't have the same feeling when I go through a CD rack as I do when I flip through uh, thousands and thousands of LPs. I'm sort of an amateur historian, uh, archivist. My first love still remains LPs. My first love also remains film score music. But then I started with jo uh, James, James Bond James stuff, Brown. you know, and I like some of the Bond music, but the first real score album I really bought and loved when we, when we serious since I start was Star Wars. Perhaps Star Wars was the score that broke through the barrier and, and drew a lot of interest back into film scoring and created a lot of interest for young people. I think it starts as film fans and then at some point, at some point when you go, I like this album I bought by John Williams. Ooh, there's another John Williams album. I've never seen this movie. The Reavers. What is it? I don't know. I think I'll buy it anyway. Then you're... Then, you know, you're... Oh, I gotta get this. Film score monthly. I think every composer, when he's writing music, he knows that, like, either it's going onto an album or somebody like us, soundtrack and nuts are going to listen to it away from the film. I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm glad they exist. It gives the music a chance to be heard. And I think most composers try to put together a record which is a serious approximation of what the movie is. And the other thing is that it's fairly listenable stuff. There are some films that I suppose you can't do that with them because it's all very aleatoric or effects-oriented kinds of stuff. I think what bothers me about soundtrack collectors is they collect based on scarcity and based on rarity of some of these promos and limited edition CDs without actually really considering how good some of this music is. There are people who will, will just collect for collecting sake. They've got, you know, they, they've got to have every LP, every CD, and you find a lot of people actually don't even listen to them. It's quite amazing. You talk, I, I talk to people, um, uh, to, to Goldsmith fans, and I say, you know, this new score that's just come out sounded like such and such a score. They had no clue what they were talking about. That's the collector's curse, when you collect just to collect. Uh, I, I must admit I'm sort of uh, cursed with that myself. Uh, I collect soundtracks, and I collect recorded soundtracks on vinyl. And there's a distinction which, which, which comes in there as to what you're collecting. Am I collecting the artifact? Are these people collecting the CD? Or are they collecting the music? Some records I collect for the music, some records I collect simply because they're rare. The music may be very bad, but it's extremely rare. I collect it for its rarity. And I'm sure you've got CD collectors like that out there as well. When you have 500 copies of a CD and around 800 people who want it, you know, you get the bidding wars. And humorously, some people have spent a lot of money on a lot of CDs. Like, my favorite is Octopussy, which, um, you know, was a, a like, $300 purchase, which just now got reissued on CD, and you can now find, you know, at your record store for like eleven ninety nine. But I think that's just the mentality of, I've got to have it, there's only a hundred of them out there. Of course, they never try to figure out why there's only a hundred of them. They just want them because there's only a hundred of them. It's, 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 it's unusual, but I think that, uh, that, that's what I don't care for. They doesn't seem to be, they don't seem to have much taste. They just seem to be in it for the market value, which is, you know, just a couple hundred people that live in their basements anyway that would want to hear these things, for the most part anyway. Is that any different than people who collect art that don't know anything about art and really don't like a painting for its own sake, but that it has value which goes beyond, I, I don't know. This is an issue that, um, am I offended by it? No. No, I'm not. I think it's interesting that a CD would ever be considered to be, you know, for itself an art form, but so is a tomato soup can. So. I don't know. These are these are not things I think about often. <laughs> well, I first became involved with Film Score Monthly because I had read in Starlog magazine, which I used to read when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. Um, and Lucas had a letter to the editor in there saying he was talking about film music, and then he said, "Anybody want to start a club?" And he wrote me. And we both wanted to contribute to this little soundtrack newsletter. When we, Lucas started Film Score Monthly, the soundtrack club, whatever you want to call it, I was going out and buying albums, and especially 1990 at Gremlins 2 and 
Total Recall, some great Jerry Goldsmith scores, and also Robocop 2 by Leonard Rosenman, which is one of the best scores of the decade. <laughs> not, it's not, I'm kidding. But that's what I really was involved with it, and I was going out and regularly buying compact discs. And I was intrigued by movie music. I thought it was great. At the time, <clears throat> there was maybe two soundtrack magazines in the world. There was Soundtrack from Belgium and whatever the Goldsmith Society was doing in England. I would be intimidated looking at their magazines because I had no idea what three quarters of the stuff they were talking about were and you know all I was interested in was like Star Trek music. So I just figured I wanted to put something out that came out a lot so that people would also get Soundtrack magazine but they'd also have to get my little newsletter because it would tell them what CDs were coming out that month. The granddaddy of all um, film music magazines was Soundtrack and practically every single Soundtrack magazine as being based on soundtrack, the way interviews are presented, the way that recordings are reviewed, and so on and so forth, is, is practically identical. And it's very collector-orientated, it's all based around recordings. The one I would strive to recall would be CinemaScore, because it was just, it was such a great document. It came out like once every two years, and you know, it could be dry in its way but you couldn't quibble with the data being presented there. This is like the first time you could ever find a photograph of, you know, James Warner. And I try to get those things in Film Score Monthly where someone in Iowa who will go, uh, oh, that's what Danny Elfman looks like. I had no idea. Because, you know, it's just sort of interesting. You want to be able to set that stuff down. What we've been trying to do with music from the movies is actually look, just deal with the music, not the collector mentality which we've been talking about but actually interested in, in the totality of the whole thing. Um, and also, we, we, we're quite strong in interviews and actually talking to composers, which we've been quite successful at doing, and uh, using it in a way for them to sell themselves. You know, that, a lot of composers have found that quite useful. I'm the only magazine here in the United States, and now I've, I've moved to Los Angeles, so I think I have more access. I've just been trying to make it more of a real magazine, and that's going to happen even more so I suppose, at the end of the day, if you're going to sum it all, it literally is just to move away from what's gone before, if that's possible, uh, and, and just produce something that's just interested in music, film music, for its own sake. There is one school of thought which I tend to be done by some magazines, which is uh, tries to be somewhat thoughtful and insightful into the art, the music, how it, the process that goes into making it, and such. And there seems to be another school of thought, which I don't agree with, which can be best described, in my opinion, as, like, I like this, therefore it is great. I don't like this, therefore it sucks. It's a lot of people dump on critics. They go, why, you know, how dare anyone write about something without being able to do it? You know, it's like the Woody Allen joke. You know, those who can't teach, teach Jim. But it's... And it's like, well, yeah, I can't write film music. I mean, I haven't even tried, who knows. But, you know, I can write about my observations of it. In the work that I'm involved with, when I'm writing a review, my goal is not to praise or trash a given product or a given score, but to inform the reader who's picking up the review to figure out, do I want to get this score, this soundtrack or not, for the bottom line. And I want to try to inform them the best that I can what the score is like, what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, why. I would prefer to analyze the score, let the reader, by reading that, figure out for themselves, do I want to buy this soundtrack or not? You can decide whether or not you like a score from a negative or a positive review. If somebody says, this is huge, big orchestral music, you know, banging away for 60 minutes, it's awful. Somebody reading that's going to say, great, and go out and buy it. So, but why bother? Why not just have a positive review? Well, I don't really buy the argument that, you know, if you have nothing nice to say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Again, I think that this is going, we are creating a body of literature about film music, and it's important that it's somewhat intelligent. <laughs> what I don't feel they fully understand what goes on, it's, it's, not always in the composer's hands. He works with what the producer gives him. He works with what 
John Milius or Steven Spielberg says, I want you to do this or that. Uh, it is subservient to A, the needs of a film and That's the right. demands of a director or producer. That's right. And to their credit, most composers work within that and turn out some incredible stuff within those boundaries. Sometimes they have the opportunity to kind of shatter those boundaries and go beyond that, yeah. but that's the exception. I think sometimes some of these self-professed critics or uh, these people who seem to think they know better fail to realize we're writing about human beings. Yeah, criticism, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's about something. We are writing about something. We're not... You know, if you want to just publicize it, go work for, you know, some PR firm. Whatever we say about um, the motives of some composers, they, they have actually labored over this. Uh, you know, and it is, it, it is their work. A lot of them are probably far more gifted at what they do and what, what we do in our own fields, in our own lives. I've never received a call from a composer who said, I hate your review or something, although apparently um, I think Lucas has a number of times. <laughs> I've probably written my, fair, my share of like nasty comments but you know it's it's out there they've, they've come back to haunt me so you know I, I've paid for my sins but I don't agree that film music reviews should be just like happy when you have a movie involving a man in the past running around to fight for and defend a woman and you hear broad romantic music for two hours you have a big soundtrack seller I mean Somewhere in time, out of Africa, Dances with Wolves, Last of the Mohicans, Legends of the Fall, Braveheart. Every time there's a score that ends up connecting with audiences, there's almost always a connection between the popularity of the film with the success of that album. And I think it's a case of the movie, of a tremendous film or a movie that people seem to enjoy with there being a high caliber of film music being contained in that movie. I think it's all marketing. I mean, there's, there's been very few scores which were successful which weren't backed up by a fairly major marketing campaign or major labels. You know, if a film is successful and the soundtrack is appearing in, <clears throat> in, in even the, 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 the most minor flea bitten store in, in, in quantity, the thing is going to sell. Summer of 42 by Michelle Legrand is another case in that. And you go through E.T. by John Williams and, you know, Batman had Prince, but Danny Elfman's score was uh, also popular. And I think it's a case of the movies being really good, but this time you have, a, you have scores in them which are equally good, and I think that combination is what produces, quote-unquote, a breakthrough score. The rest of the community out there, to me, is still pretty ignorant of film music, unless it's um, Dances with Wolves, a very popular movie, and then people become very interested in the music and they'll buy it. But I'm not sure that that leads to them starting to take film music seriously. They don't start studying other John Barry scores and seeing what other composers write. And even when there is a successful score like Last of the Mohicans, I just have to say that I don't think people really care that much about film music, normal uh, mainstream people, even the average moviegoer. I think that they just want to hear the music. They don't care who's written it. Yeah, first. I don't even think I can tell you the names of the composers necessarily. Well, James Warner did. Legends of the Fall and Titanic. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> and in that case, maybe they're just buying it as a souvenir of the film. Maybe they do like the music, but perhaps not enough to go out and buy another Trevor Jones or Randy Edelman score. Music never sounds as good as it does on a really good movie. You know, a really well-acted, directed, and written picture. Music sounds great on those films. You can put the same score on a lousy movie, and it's not going to be terribly noticeable. Some of the great concert works of the 20th century began as film scores, and most notably Alexander Nevsky, which the composer took the film soundtrack and remolded it into perhaps one of the greatest concert works of our time. Copeland certainly has done it, and many right. others. There's probably this misconception that the concert hall uh, has always had a greater amount of freedom throughout history. That's not true when you realize that a lot of the music, certainly Beethoven's time and and uh, Mozart, it was all commissioned by the princes of the court or the king himself. And uh, there were all, it was always, you know, the thing that we get accused of of writing program music. Bach would get commissions to do a new cantata or something or an organ piece for uh, a Sunday service. They'd call him up Monday saying, okay, we need it by Saturday so we can rehearse it. And so he'd have to go off and find the inspiration and 
you know, get the, the, get the organ piece turned in so he can get his paycheck. Music's always been that way. I mean, very few great composers have been independently wealthy and they could write whatever they want. You also have the audiences to please. The orchestra is a, is a business, just like Hollywood's a business. You have the traditional war horses. People go to concerts and listen to their favorite classical pieces of music and concert works. And then there are concert works in the 20th century where everything is changing. My guess is a lot of the people out there that don't understand music on that level and just want to appreciate it are looking for more music. They don't want to just keep hearing 1812 Overture, obviously, in Appalachian Spring. But the hunger there might be why some conductors and orchestras are bringing film music into their repertoire. It's one of the few areas, I, I think, that um, um, large works are being commissioned on a regular basis, uh, just because of the, the financial restrictions of a symphony orchestra being able to commission a, a new ballet or a new opera, and of course they do. But if you look at the output of the Hollywood film composing community it's, uh, and around the world, there's a lot of stuff. I don't think that film music concerts have actually developed an audience yet as they might, uh, but I think they've gone leaps and bounds, particularly in the last 20 years. You know, a real artistic director um, of any large philharmonic, they're constantly aware of the, the financial, commercial pressures that are upon them. So, back to your question, I think that, um, yeah, I think this is one reason why there is an interest in film music, because depending upon the formal requirements of the movie itself, um, depending upon the strength of the director and the imagination of the composer and the director together, you could do some outrageously uh, interesting things. You know, for all the stuff that's written about how film music is another form of classical music, I really think it's like another form of pop music. And you play the Rocky, you know, theme, and it's a, it's a pop hit. You know, you, we're not talking about Anna Silvestri's latest sequel score, we're talking about Bernard Herrmann's score for Psycho or Alex North's score for Streetcar Named Desire. You know, that is, is, is what we're judging film music by, or we should be judging it by, not by the latest thing which, you know, Hans Zimmer zipped off his computer. By definition, it's, it's a commercial medium. It's made for hire, and um, generally it's done rather, rather quickly by Brahms standards, let's say. You know, I think the first symphony took 15 years to write for him, which was way too long. Um, so I think there's the, perhaps there's the perception that it's, it's just a hack work, um, and sometimes it can be. There's a, an elitism about classical music, um, but I mean the argument I would use is well, you know, name me twenty or thirty pieces of music written in the concert hall during the last fifty years that were really any good, you know, and I could reel off a hundred film scores that were probably better than most of it. Is my answer to that. I mean, again, it all comes back to what, you know, what the formal dictates of, of the film are in, in the film music world. That's what it should be about. The concert hall is anybody, you know, if you had a nightmare the night before and you want to write about it, then maybe that's what it would sound like. As to what happens in the future, I would hope more uh, recognition is paid to some of the beautiful music that the film score composers uh, Put out. However, I wouldn't put that high on my probability list. I think money is what talks, certainly in Hollywood, and that's why you see most movies coming out, or many movies coming out with the rock pre-recorded soundtracks, which are, at least from my standpoint, mostly non-collectible, but that's what sells. I think it's great that there has been a renaissance in film music. I think it's terrific that we're at a point right now where so much of the classic unreleased albums like Poltergeist have been finally released. I think it's terrific that we've had expanded versions of soundtracks and soundtracks with previously unreleased material. And I think it's terrific and apparently they've been selling well. Record labels have fallen over themselves to do this stuff. You just think of the number of releases in the last 10 years of you know, remastered scores, restored scores and re-recorded scores. I can say we've, um, I think we've uh, got a lot to be grateful for. There's a lot more that could be done. Um, a lot of scores still are neglected. Um, but I think we do do very well. People still bitch about the stuff not on CD. But the number of things that have come out in CD in the last five to seven years, the, I mean, reissues of old good stuff, it's just an it's enormous list. And the number of books that have come out, and there's a handful of documentaries that have been made. <laughs> And uh, 
just like the publicity. I mean, there is much more publicity for film music than there was seven years ago. And it's, I mean, I'm just, a, you know, a part of that, you know, the coincidence of that. If I see anything in the media future, I see a return to large orchestras. A, a lot less emphasis upon uh, purely synthesized scores. You need to look at what kinds of films are being made, and I think there are a lot of films being made about people, again, you know, as well as the large action things, which, you know, you can't have a, a, an outer space epic without a hundred-piece orchestra. It'd be hard to. I think it's getting more visibility and with it more sort of respect as a as a sort of legitimate offshoot of both classical and pop music. Hey, it's good music. You have to like music. And uh, the people that are interested in film scores like music. I think that's what's, whether I agree or disagree with a lot of the opinions I read, not only in Lucas's magazine, but I see on the internet, you know that people love the music. There are a lot of good people I can name today who are just out, starting out. John Debney, William Ross, uh, David Arnold, uh, a young guy, Dave Reynolds, who I heard a, a tape of the other day. Um, Marco Bel Marco Beltrami. Beltrami who, yeah. These are young guys who have a love for the art, mm -hmm. who want to do good work. And my feeling is, those in time, who knows what, what they will give us. You know, and then there's the Hans Zimmer School of Composition. It's really, really, to me, probably the most significant new statement in terms of dramatic music writing and films that I've heard. Um, but I probably, since I've been listening to it, I mean, there's orchestral music and electronic music, and then the combining of the two. But the most significant new development to me was this Hans Zimmer sound that was synthesized orchestra, where the music sounds orchestrally conceived, but frequently it's played, you know, in terms of samples and things. It's very rhythmically aggressive. It's not particularly melodic. You know, there's not a Henry Mancini melody. It's just very rhythmic, action-oriented, but it has kind of a kinetic energy. And that seems to be, like if you go to an action movie today, that's the kind of sound that you're sort of thinking of. So it's certainly a significant change. I don't know if it's a good one. It's just it's definitely a major change. I'm very optimistic that there will be a lot of very good film music. You know, and I'm pessimistic because still 90% of it will be unbearable. But there is a lot of bad film music, which is background music, which is com you know completely incidental and tailored to the, the, the you know the images it was uh, intended for. You know, Eighty percent probably. Well, then eighty percent of of classical music is awful as well. Eighty percent of popular music is probably awful, but there is twenty percent which stands out and which keeps us going, keeps us interested in it. I love film music, and uh, my particular little. Part of it is basically trying to get the word out to other people to try to get them at least to listen, to open their ears, uh, and they'd be surprised at what they hear out there. I enjoy what I do. I enjoy being a collector, and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Thanks for providing me a very interesting life, a very rewarding life. I'm just glad I do it.